The speaker that we have today, I've known for over 40 years. I've been married to her for 38 this month. Uh, she is a mom of five, uh, going to be a grandmother of eight. Um, she is a mother-in-law. And uh, six months ago, I asked her, would you speak at uh, Mother's Day? And uh, then about a month later, she said, I've been studying through the book of Ruth, and I have a message. And I said, well, that's good. Uh, we have ministered together for 38 years. You have to understand that before Gwen and I were married, she was on staff. She was the second woman on staff in a fellowship church that was not a church secretary or church administrator. Her role in that church uh, at Northminster Baptist Church in the Jane Finch area of Toronto. Uh, her role there was Christian education and music uh, director. And uh, she also did a stint with me recently through COVID to be our ministry director in that, in that area. And I'm just very thankful that we are partners in ministry. And I'm very thankful for her uh, taking this on this morning. The last few years, we've had different women speak on Mother's Day particularly, or we've highlighted key um, ministries to women. And uh, so this morning, I'm uh, glad to introduce uh, Gwen to you all today. Uh, she is my wife, so just so you know, and, and uh, part of this church. And for some of you who are new, maybe ha do not know her yet, but uh, she's going to come now. And, and I asked her, do you want me to hug you, kiss you before you speak? She said, no. So just get out. <laughs> what Robin didn't tell you is that he actually for years now has asked me to speak every Mother's Day. And every Mother's Day I say no. That, but God had been putting on my heart something I really felt that he wanted me to share. And so I made an agreement with God that if Robin asked this year, I would say yes. And I did. So here I am. I said to my mom, I'm preaching on Mother's Day. She said, really? And I said, yeah. I said, I'll be shorter than the other guys. <laughs> and she said, that'll be nice for a change. <laughs> anyway, let's just look to the Lord as we look to his word. Father, I just want to thank you for this opportunity. Lord, I know it is an opportunity to open your word and to look at what you have to teach us today. Father, just be pleased to use my words to speak into our hearts and our lives and teach us what you want us to learn. Lord, we love you so much. You are so good to us. And we thank you for what you're going to do. In your precious name, amen. December 30th, 2011, I became a mother-in-law. Mothers-in-law get a bad rap. There are many jokes about mothers-in-law. My mother-in-law is so talented, she can make a mountain out of a molehill, even when there's no molehill. <laughs> How many mothers-in-law does it take to change a light bulb? None. They prefer to criticize your lighting choices instead. <laughs> What's the best way to get along with your mother-in-law? Pretend you're invisible, and she won't notice you. I did not want to be that kind of mother-in-law, so I went to the scriptures for guidance. I found the story of Naomi. Naomi has been described as a caring, gracious, and altruistic mother-in-law. I love that. That's what I wanted to be. As I looked into Naomi's story, I realized that these principles were for people growing their family, whether that be a personal family, an extended family, or even our church family here. Let's look at this story together. Please turn to Ruth chapter 1. And I'll begin reading it at verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Aphrodites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab to live there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, 
both Malon and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. When Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in a home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud, and said to her, We will go back with you and to your people. But when Naomi said, Return home, my daughters, why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this, they wept aloud. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and to her gods. Go back with her. The first principle that I see here is that Naomi accepted her daughters-in-law for who they were. She followed her husband to a foreign land, and then her sons married Moabite women. This must have been a heartache for her. She probably had very little to say about it because her husband was dead and her sons would have been able to make their own decisions. But you can tell by the way her daughters-in-law loved her that she must have loved and accepted them for who they were. This is really important in a family. We pray from the time our children are little that they will marry the person that God has chosen for them. But this person comes with different backgrounds, different family dynamics, different desires, different dreams. We need to accept them for who they are and pray that God will continue to develop them into who he wants them to be. This is not about us. It is about them. It is about wanting God's best for our children and trusting that he is leading them. Even if your children are not following the Lord, he can still work in their lives and work in their spouse's lives to bring them to him. But as we, as in-laws, we just must love them for who they are. I remember many years ago in our church, we had a wonderful Christian lady whose daughter was in the lesbian lifestyle. She would bring home many partners, and this woman would just care for those people and love them and teach them about God. Many of them came to know the Lord and left her daughter. And then eventually, her daughter came to know the Lord as well. She loved them for who they were, and then she loved them to Christ. This principle is true in our church as we're growing as well. We need to welcome new people just as they are, not as we think they should be. Once when Robin was doing a church consult, I was helping, and there was an older treasurer there. Robin was interviewing him to get a feel for how to turn the church around from this older congregation. What he said will never leave me. He said, the quality of the people who are coming in is not the same as the quality of the people who are here. That made me so sad. And you know what? Two days later, that man died. God does not want us judging people as they come in. He wants us to love them. He wants us to accept them and to encourage them as part of our family. Not only does she accept them for who they are, she puts them first. Look at verse 8. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud, and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons? Who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. What lay before Naomi in Bethlehem was very little without the presence of her husband and two sons. She would have had her husband's estate, 
but it would be of little use to her. There would be no crops to harvest. The house had probably not been lived in for 10 years or perhaps was being lived in by somebody else. Being a, a widow, she probably was quite poor and would be bringing back very little. She had nothing to offer these daughters-in-law. Besides that, the most important thing for women in that time was a husband for security, and Naomi knew that she could never offer Orpah and Ruth a husband. Her family was finished, and she could not give them another husband. And these two were foreigners where she was going, so the likelihood of them finding a husband was very small. She easily could have expected them to come with her and support her in her needs, but she was putting them first. When Robin and I were in choir together in Bible school, our choir verse was Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Let each of you not only look to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. That is what Naomi did for Ruth and Orpah. She considered them as better than herself, and she did not look at her interest, but looked at their interest and their needs. That is what God calls us to do in the family. I think too often we try and figure out how our in-laws will fit into our family instead of putting their interests first. I have found that young couples are torn in many different directions. They're balancing two extended families as well as trying to build up their own. The more expectations we put on them, the harder it is. We need to be putting their interests ahead of our own, praying for them and letting them decide what's best for them, not what's best for us. Again, this is true in the church. How often do we meet new people and maybe hear, oh, they're a teacher. Oh, you would be great if you taught in our Sunday school group. Or we hear that they have a special talent and we're quick to push them in that direction to help us. But that's not our job. Our job is to encourage and support them as better than ourselves and pray that God will lead them, God will lead them to be a part of our church family. The next thing that Naomi did for Ruth was that she was real in how she felt. Look at verse 19. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman said, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Amara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitter, bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? The name Naomi means pleasant or gentle. The name Mara means bitter. She did not hide from her friends or from Ruth that she was hurting. She had lost much, and she had admitted that she would lost much. The interesting thing here is that commentaries mention she did not lose her faith. Courtney Jacob from Groundwork writes, and yet if we listen closely to her lament, we encounter a surprisingly strong faith. In the Groundwork episode, Walking in Faith, host, sorry, host Scott Hosey gives us one reason we can be sure Naomi still believes and has faith in God when he says, Atheists and agnostics don't write psalms of lament. Pe people of faith do. Lament does not indicate that we no longer believe in God. Rather, when we are angry with God or feel abandoned by him, we actually direct our grief and sorrow straight at him. In a backhanded way, this reflects our belief that he is still involved and does care about the details of our life. Coming back to the family and the family of God, too often we try to be perfect. We try hard not to show weakness or struggle. But what does that say to the people who are struggling? That they could feel like a failure. When we had four young children, we had invited another family of four young children over. We cleaned the house. Well, actually what we did was we took all the clutter and put it in our bedroom. So the house looked clean, but the bedroom was the telltale sign. Anyway, we had this family over for dinner, and the mom had to go to the washroom, and she came back, and she said, oh, Gwen, I walked into your home, and I felt like such a failure. I looked around, and I thought, she's got the same amount of kids as I do, and look how clean her house is. And then I opened your bedroom door. <laughs> 
and it made me feel so much better. And that was then I realized I don't have to be perfect all the time. I don't have to be the one who never hurts and who never struggles. I can be real and people can know me like that. It is okay for us to let people know we are struggling. It is okay not to be perfect, but like Naomi, we need to keep our faith and our focus on God. The next thing that Naomi does for Ruth is to keep her mouth shut. Look at chapter 2, um, verse 1. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. When Ruth came to Naomi and said, let me go to the fields and pick over leftover grain, Naomi could have given her instruction. Well, go there, but make, be sure you don't go there. And you go with these people, but don't go over there. It's probably what I would have done. Instead, she just said, gave her her blessing. She said, go ahead, my daughter. I'm sure that Naomi prayed that God would lead her. I'm sure that Naomi trusted God to take her to the right place. Going into the fields could be dangerous. Ruth was poor, without influence, and a member of a minority group. But Naomi simply gave her her blessing. Sometimes we talk too much. Do you like to give your opinion? We live in a society where opinions seem to be important. There are even radio and talk shows that have groups of people who are not experts, but just give their opinions on various topics. We often give our opinion when really we just need to be quiet and let God lead our families. When we had four teenagers in the house at one time, I just felt like I was nagging all the time. And so I started praying and saying, Lord, keep my mouth shut if you don't want me to say anything. Then I told my oldest daughter that, and she said, how's that working for you, Mom? <laughs> I guess she didn't think I was doing a very good job. But I continue to pray that to this day. Sometimes I just know that God wants me to say nothing. I will think about something to say, but then I try and ask God, if he wants me to share it, then someone will ask me. And you know what? Not many people ask. <laughs> I guess he just wants me to keep my opinions to myself. As Ruth went out into the fields, Naomi kept quiet and just blessed her. In this church family, do you need to consider keeping quiet about your opinions and wait for God to ask you to share them? Sometimes keeping quiet is the hardest thing to do, but it allows us to trust God to lead instead of trying to control situations ourselves. One other thing I want you to see is in verse 3 of chapter 2. So she went out entering a field and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz. I love that phrase, as it turned out. The New King James Version says she happened to come to that part. This is God. There's no accidental placement here. God ordained and God led. God is ordaining and God is leading in each one of our lives. Even though we don't see the whole plan, he continues to work. Finally, Naomi did share with Ruth when God led her to. Look at uh, Ruth 3, verse 1. One day, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Now Boaz, who's with whose women you have been working, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know that you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. <clears throat> then go and uncover his feet and lay down. He will tell you what to do. Naomi here, again, is putting Ruth's interests above her own. She wants to find a home for her to be well provided for, and she knows Boaz has shown favor to Ruth. 
She knows the customs of her people, and Ruth has no idea what to do. So Naomi, Naomi explains step by step what she should do, and Ruth obeys. She goes to the threshing floor and lays at the feet of Boaz. He knows right away what this means, and yet is such a man of integrity, he says to her that there is one other who has the right to redeem her, but he will look after it. Then go down to verse 16. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, how did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, he gave me these six measures of barley saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. Again, I love this. I think that if I were Naomi, I'd be trying to manipulate it, trying to figure out how we could work it so that she got Boaz. But Naomi just waits and trusts that Boaz will work it out. This is another reminder to me that even when things are going well, sometimes we still have to wait for answers. And it's good for our children to see us patiently waiting. It's good for others to see us patiently waiting for God's will in our lives and in their lives. How do we patiently wait? We trust God. It truly is that simple. It's understanding who God is and how much he loves us and wants the best for us. That best can come in all kinds of forms, maybe forms we don't necessarily want. But if we see God for who he truly is, we can trust him and wait patiently for him. The result of Naomi accepting people for who they are, putting others first, being honest about what she is going through, keeping quiet when needed, speaking when led, and then waiting and trusting. Chapter 4, Naomi gains a son. Verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he had made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. The woman said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Picture this for a moment. Naomi's sitting in the corner of her room, and somebody comes in with this baby and lays it in her arms. The sadness has turned to joy. The discouragement has turned to hope. The bitterness of Mara has turned to the pleasantness of Naomi once again. God has blessed, and I'm sure in that moment, Naomi feels blessed. Don't you love verse 15? He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Benson's commentary says, See how God sometimes makes up the want of those relationships from whom we expected most comfort in those from whom we expected least. The bonds of love prove stronger than those of nature. Have you ever had that happen? Someone ministers to you that you never thought would be able to? Or someone offers you comfort when you actually thought you should give them comfort? I think that says something about our church family. We can provide comfort and love because we are part of the family of God. We don't have to be bound by blood. We are bound by Christ. So you may ask me what kind of mother-in-law I turned out to be. Not a perfect one, I can assure you. But I have three great in-laws and seven wonderful grandchildren, almost eight. Not to mention the five children I have of my own. So like Naomi, I feel like I'm a very blessed mother-in-law. As we look toward our new building that hopefully we will be in next summer, let's remember the principles of growing our family. Accept people for who they are. Put others' interests ahead of our own. Be honest about what we are going through. Be quiet about our opinions unless we're asked. Share God's truth when needed. 
and wait and trust God to work. As I conclude, I just want to tell you one more story, and then I want to pray for the women in our congregation. My mom is 89 years old and has been really struggling with her health over the last few weeks. Friday evening, my sister and I were sitting in a merge with her, and it was quite cool in the room, and we could not get her warm. She had a house coat that she ended up laying on, and we thought maybe if, if we could get that out from under her and put it on top of her, it might warm her up. So we did, and she looked up at my sister and she said, put that on Gwen, she's cold. <laughs> that is what moms do. They sacrificially look after others before themselves. Even when they're 89 and their daughters are 63, they're still looking after them. We have many women in this church, mothers, mothers-in-law, grandmothers, aunts, and other women who love and impact people every day. And I just want you all to stand, and I want to pray for you now. So ladies, please stand. Lord, I thank you for the women who stand before me. Thank you for how you have made each one of them special for your purposes. I pray that you would bless them like you did Naomi. Continue to lead them and guide them as they continue to seek them. Continue to use them in the lives of their families, in their friends, and in this church, Lord, that you might be glorified in everything that we do. We love you so much, Lord, and we love these ladies, and we thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen.